Hey guys, this is John, and I'm back again from Dallas. And one round is in the books at the UT Dallas Fall Fee Day Open. And in the first round, I got paired up to Grandmaster Samuel Sevian, who's one of the most promising young players in the country, um, if not the world. He is 14 years old, and many of you may know him from a YouTube video that kind of went viral where he beat Greg Shahadi in a blitz game when he was, I think, 10 years old. So this guy's been around chess for quite a while, and um, his accolades are through the roof. And Sam and I had actually played once before in a game about a year and a half ago, which I lost. So I was out for revenge in this one. So I was black, so you're actually seeing this from my point of view. And it was a Scandi. I know you guys would be very happy to see that opening. And I also wanted to play it against, against him and see how uh, he reacted. Last time I played him, I played E5. And we had a very theoretical Roy Lopez where he kind of ground me down. So not today. We're starting uh, the tournament on the right foot and playing the Scandi in round one. So he took the pawn, I took the queen, he played knight c3, and I went queen d8. And he played d4, I played knight f6, and now bishop c4. So uh, those of you who follow my channel will know that I've had this position quite a bit from the black side, and the move a6 is a nice move for black that I've uh, played many times in the past, in particular some of the chess rivals, Games that I played against Danny Wrench have reached this position. And the idea for black is to go b5, kick the bishop, and then quickly follow with c5. And try to overwhelm white on the queen side. So, I like this line because it kind of runs contrary to what happens in the Scandi in some of the other lines, like queen a5 on move 3 and lines like that. Um, you don't often see black really pushing white around on this wing. At least not until the middle game. But with a6, black immediately puts white on notice that b5 is coming. So some players do play a4 here to stop b5, although this move is not good because it kind of weakens the b4 square. Black can play knight c6, and often the knight will get in here. So Sevillon just played knight f3. He just developed. And I went ahead and played b5. He played bishop b3. And now here's the idea for black, which I think caught Sevillon by surprise a little bit. After the game, he admitted that he wasn't sure what to do against this line. So I played c5. And this does sacrifice a pawn temporarily for black. However, if white takes it, and we get an exchange on d1, regardless of how white takes back, let's say they even take with the knight so as to keep kingside castling open, uh, black will regain this pawn. This is only temporarily uh, an issue, but black will play e6, and if white defends the pawn by like bishop e3, black always has moves like knight e4 to double attack c5 with the knight and the bishop, or knight fd7, and white cannot look forward to keeping this. And I found that this bishop on b3 is often just a bad piece in this line. So Sevillon understood that immediately, and hence he did not take on c5, and instead played a very dynamic move. So after uh, c5 was played, he played a4. So looking to fight back on the queen side a little bit, and giving me a decision whether to play b4 or c4. c4 looks tempting at first to try to shut out this light square bishop, but after bishop a2, I think the position of the black pawns on the queen side is untenable. Uh, I believe that white will eventually break up those pawns, and I'm overextended is the gist of this position. So I played b4 instead, kicking his knight. He played knight e2, and now I played e6. So I am behind in development here. You notice that I only have one piece out. It's my knight on f6. Uh, but I gained some space on the queen side, and as long as these pawns don't become weak, and as long as white can't generate an immediate attack, I gotta believe that black is okay here. So after e6, Sevillon castled. I played knight c6. Now I want to bring my pieces into the game, try to catch up on development. And here, I think he played a move that uh, was a little optimistic. And I was uh, surprised after the game, he, he mentioned this moment, and he said that after his next move, he felt like he was fighting for a draw for the rest of the game. And bear in mind, this is only move 11, and he's the grandmaster with the white pieces. So I was surprised to hear him say that. Uh, but I, I like that objectivity by him. That kind of shows you how willing top players are to criticize their own moves. He didn't try to defend this move in the postmortem. He just he said, yeah, this was just flat out bad. So he played bishop g5. And flat out bad is maybe an exaggeration on my part. But I don't believe the bishop belongs here. I was expecting bishop e3. I really thought he would play this move to... Uh, not only reinforce d4, but also just to threaten to take on c5. It's debatable like how big of a threat this is, because kind of like the variations earlier, 
Um, in the event of a capture here, black always could try to regain the pawn with moves like knight e4, maybe after a queen trade, like knight e4 or knight e7. So it's possible, had Sevian played bishop e3, I would have just played a developing move like bishop e7, maybe bishop b7, but uh, probably this because I want to prepare castling short. But nevertheless, the point stands that he should have played uh, the bishop to e3 rather than, as he did in the game, bishop g5. So after bishop g5, I just played bishop e7, and he played queen d3, so developing the queen and also connecting the rooks. This could be a prelude to a move like rook a d1, which he plays very soon. So I castled. Um, you notice that I'm keeping the bishop on c8. Often in this line, the bishop will go to b7. The reason I was doing that was to discourage white from setting up sacrifices on e6. I really didn't want white to go after this pawn. So let's say hypothetically I play bishop b7. I thought that this could be an issue in a lot of lines. And say black were to castle here, then a move like bishop takes e6. And if I take back, knight takes, and there's a fork on the queen and the rook. Uh, this is just kind of a fantasy variation. It may not even work for white because of moves like knight takes d4 before the sacrifice occurs. But that's just kind of a glimpse into what I was thinking in terms of this bishop. Whereas I felt like bishop e7 was kind of a mandatory move. I really want to get that piece out in castle. Maybe my bishop would be better off like on c8 or even on d7 later. So I might as well keep this pawn protected. So, so here I castled. Uh, black, uh, white played rook a d1. And white's entirely coordinated now. They're pretty well developed. But they don't really have too many objects for attack because my structure is so solid. And... Here I played knight a5, going after this light square bishop. And naturally white wants to keep the bishop pair and um, disallow an exchange. So I thought he might play just bishop a2 right away, but he actually played knight e5, which gives me th something to think about in terms of the c6 square. So I didn't want to take here yet because I felt like if I take, he would take with the queen uh, or possibly even play knight c6 right away. That's an interesting move too with the fork on the queen and the bishop, and after my queen moves, let's say queen e8, he can take here, check, queen takes, and maybe then recapture. And I'm behind in development, and I've lost a valuable defender of my king side. And I'm kind of in a pin right here. So after knight e5, I didn't want to capture the bishop straight away. So knight e5. And after this, uh, queen c7 was played. So I just got out of the way of the D file and also controlled the C6 square. And he played bishop f4, kind of tracking the movement of my queen. And I played bishop d6. In some ways, I was a little nervous to play bishop d6 because there is some tension on the D file. Um, should white ever take here, the file will be completely open. But note that white cannot do that right away because I just take on e5 and I win a piece. So I... I kind of figured that the, um, the pressure on the knight would be worth it to play this move. And I get to keep my queen on c7. I don't have to like move my queen or kind of hide it in the face of this bishop f4 nuisance. So bishop d6. And here, Sevian played bishop a2, so disallowing the possibility of knight takes b3. And I completed my development. I played bishop b7. So I don't think there's any issue on e6 anymore. Note that the dark square bishop for white is occupying the square that the knight might want to go to to set up sacrifices here. So I felt completely comfortable playing bishop b7. And uh, a word about the time control. So the time control for this tournament is game in 90 minutes with a 30 second increment. And Sevian was using a lot of time. I have noticed he has a, a, a tendency to get in time pressure. And that definitely happened this game. So he was already burning quite a bit of his 90 minutes at this point, and towards the end of the game, he was uh, pretty far down on time, although I gave a bunch of the time back, as it turns out. So uh, after this, he played c3, so creating more tension with the pawns, and I took on c3. He took with a pawn, and here I played bishop e4, attacking the queen. I felt like I had a really good position, and... Moving a rook definitely came to mind. Like, I thought about rook a d8 to kind of track white's queen and uh, maybe introduce bishop takes e5 ideas later using the, the d file pressure. The thing I didn't like about this move, though, is that it takes away a defender of a6. 
So if ever I want to play bishop e4 later, I might have to reckon with queen takes a6. So hence I played bishop e4 directly, attacking white's queen. And after this, he fled to d2. So queen d2. And now I played rook a d8. Rook f d8 also came to mind. This is the classic, like, which rook do you move to a certain square question. Uh, the only reason I chose rook a d8, well, there's kind of two reasons. Uh, one, I thought maybe the a8 square for this light square bishop could be useful. Like, if ever I want to retreat this bishop and then play queen b7 and set up a battery, like, towards this g2 pawn, that is enabled by playing rook a d8. Uh, but more so, the, the reasoning was I want to keep this rook defending f7, just in case knight takes f7, or, you know, I was still, like, there were some lingering thoughts about the, the pressure with the light square bishop on e6. So I thought rook a d8 was... Uh, the, the safer move, so that's why I chose that. So here, Sevian played rook f e1. I could tell he wasn't really happy about his position. I mean, he's kind of making meeker moves. They These aren't going to instill a lot of fear in black. But rook f e1 is solid. The rook wasn't doing anything on the f file, so just gets it to a potentially useful file. And here I played a good move. Um, he, he praised this move afterwards. He said this was a good decision by me. So... I figured that this knight wasn't doing anything on the side of the board. Earlier it came here to attack the light square bishop, but it's kind of done its job. So I played knight c6, and the, the pride of white's position right now is this knight on e5. As it stands with the knight on a5, like I never can really get rid of that, because giving up my dark square bishop would be too big of a price after white recaptures with their dark square bishop. However, I am totally open to the idea of trading knight for knight, so doing a knight swap. So Knight c6 is motivated by the desire to swap those pieces and get rid of white's best piece, this knight on e5. So anytime you can um, like solve an issue with one of your poorly placed pieces, like my knight on the rim right here, and also try to knock out one of your opponent's good pieces, that's usually a net gain by you. So knight c6 and Sevian took the knight. There's a lot of pressure on e5, so it makes sense. And I took with the queen. And I like this a lot because now I have a new battery on the pawn on g2. And he played f3 to kind of blunt that. I dropped the bishop to g6. And he took on d6. So more swaps. But here I get to take with the rook. And I was liking my position a lot. I started feeling like I was uh, better at this point And maybe not even slightly better. I think significantly better. Uh, because black's position is easier to play. There's this pawn tension on d4, and this is the pawn that I'm going to hammer. And you also notice that I'm attacking their a4 pawn right now. So white has some issues with their loose pawns, and this is kind of a, a Scandinavian player's dream where you have a compact structure and your opponent does not. So I was looking forward to attacking these weaknesses. Also, I don't really have any bad pieces, and this piece is soon going to enter the game when I double up the rooks. So rook takes d6, and Sevian pushed the a pawn. So making sure queen takes a4 is never possible. And I doubled up as planned. I thought about playing queen c7 in this move. Uh, in, in this move. Uh, the idea being to attack a5. But I rejected it because of queen f4. I thought white might set up a counter threat on my rook. And in doing so, pin the rook at the same time. So that's why I didn't play that move. So instead, rook fd8. And he played king h1. This is just a prophylactic move. I think it's a good move. Um, white didn't have a lot of active possibilities at this stage because they're already pretty tied down to the defense of the d-pawn. I'm hitting that three times. So king h1 just diverts any possible issue on this diagonal and hides the king a little bit. Now here, uh, if you want to, you can pause your video and try to find a good move for black. Uh, I thought the move I came up with was pretty decent. It's possible there's uh, even better alternatives. But pause the video if you like and see what you can figure out. Black to move. Okay, so the move I played here was e5. And I figured if I was going to win this game or try to play for a win, uh, I would want to attack either d4 or a5 in these weak pawns, as I discussed a moment ago. And e5 is a great way to bring about more pressure on this pawn. And this pawn is pinned. White cannot take either way because they would immediately lose their queen on, it, on d2. So I'm just trying to increase the pressure on that point. I do open white's light square bishop a bit, but the pressure on d4 is the bigger factor. 
Note that f7 is well guarded by my bishop, so I don't think that's an issue. Uh, the move that Sevillon mentioned in the postmortem that he felt was even stronger was queen c7. So this move that I mentioned uh, a move ago, but in a slightly different form, an improved form for black, because here queen f4 doesn't make a lick of difference. Black can just take on a5 because we've already got the rook on d8 backing up the other rook. So that was a reasonable possibility, queen c7. I actually saw this move during the game, but I rejected it because of rook a1, which looks absolutely ridiculous, but the idea is that if black takes on a5, white can respond with bishop takes e6, discovery. Uh, still, though, in Sevian's opinion, uh, it would have been it would have been worth it for me to try to draw the rook over. And actually, I can still play e5 even here if I want. So probably he is correct about that. I'm going to defer to the Grandmaster on that point. <laughs> um, while e5 gives me an advantage, maybe I could have maximized it with queen c7 instead. So after e5, he decided to flee the file, so he played queen b2. And here, I played a move to increase the pressure on d4. I played queen d7. So tripling on the d file. And this is not quite a Alakine's gun, because I don't have my queen in the back with the rooks ahead of it. The queen's right in the middle of the rooks. But now we're bringing a lot of heat down on d4. I have one, two, three, four, five attackers. I don't know how well you can see that based on the camera angle, but five attackers on d4. And he has several defenders, one, two, three, four, but not quite enough. So round about here, I realized I was going to win this d4 pawn. So after queen d7, Sevillon played rook d2, and I took on d4 with the c-pawn. He takes with his c-pawn. I took with the e-pawn. So one line I wanted to look at here to make sure um, I wasn't blundering in the game, because notice I still have a back rank issue. I haven't moved any of these pawns in front of my king. So I was slightly concerned at various moments in this game, like if this rook on the e-file would be a big deal. So let's say hypothetically white takes here. And then I take and we initiate a bunch of these trades. And fortunately for me, at the end of this line, white does not have rook e8 checkmate because of the knight. So if you saw that line, uh, kudos to you because that's one factor in my calculations that was important. Uh, not a very difficult line, but you know all those little details can, can add up in the course of a game. So it just transpires that white has difficulty... Uh, getting their pawn back because they don't have tactical means to do that. So after taking on d4, um, he played, or sorry, this rook is on d2, so he played rook ed1, so attacking the d-pawn again, but fortunately I can advance it to d3, so I come here and attack his knight, and he moves it to f4. So this is a key moment in the game. Uh, I was up on time at this point, but not by a whole lot. He had maybe... I'd say under two minutes left, and I had something like 10 to 15. And I burned a lot of time here trying to figure out what to do. I knew I was better because I'm up a pawn and white is struggling to get it back. Uh, however, the move that I played like wasn't really that challenging to white. So I think I should have played bishop f5 here to avoid knight takes g6. And maybe it was my Scandi instincts kicking in, but I didn't think like this structure would be that big of a deal. Uh, but importantly for white, they've got rid of that bishop, which is a defender of d3, and that's the primary motivation for him playing knight f4. It seems weird, but he wants to trade down, even though he's down a pawn, in a bid to get rid of that bishop. So I think I should have played bishop f5. I saw this move in the game, but I kind of underestimated it. Um, I think I kind of rationalized avoiding this move by saying, like, well, what if white like attacks me with g4, although that move's kind of ridiculous. Like, I could just play bishop e6 even if I wanted uh, or I thought, well, what if white plays queen e5 and maybe bothers this piece? But the reality is g4, queen e5, neither of these moves is very challenging. So I think I should have done this. Um, instead, though, I played an aggressive-looking move that uh, actually ends up winning the a pawn, but it's just not quite good enough to win the game. So I played queen a4, which is a double attack on the knight and also the pawn. But he goes take on g6. I took with the h pawn. And now a, a very strong move, Grandmaster move, Queen b3. Um, maybe not Grandmaster, I think a lot of people would play this move, but <laughs> again, it's counterintuitive because white is offering a trade, but in doing this, they dissipate a lot of the pressure on their position, and they counterattack f7. So 
uh, after queen b3, he mentioned afterwards that he thought I should actually take on a5 and even allow queen takes f7 check. And I think he's correct about that. If I want to try to win this position, I should allow this to happen, even though it looks kind of scary and my king side is wrecked, because I still am up a pawn. And he said that because based on the game, I didn't really put up uh, too many obstacles to him achieving the draw. So after queen b3, I just traded the queens. He took, of course. And now the issue for black here is that it's hard to hold this pawn in the long run. Now that some pieces have been exchanged, oh yeah, and this pawn is here, that's important. Now that some pieces have been exchanged, he can try to bring his king to the center. So he's literally going to march his king up to e3 and then just gobble the d-pawn. And it's tough for me because I can't easily get another defender on d3. Like if I want to maneuver my knight, like so let's say I wanted to get my knight to like c5. I'd probably have to go through d7 to get there, but as soon as I go to d7, he'll just take that pawn. And my rook on d8 is not assisting in defending d3. So white has this straightforward and annoying plan of just bringing his king up and taking here and winning the pawn back. So I had seen there was a way I could um, still squeeze something out of this, so I played rook d4. This was to stop bishop c4. I didn't want his bishop coming there and attacking both of those weak pawns. And he played king g1. I played king f8. He played king f2. And here I swung my rook over to b4. Uh, the engine pointed out a line afterwards whereby I might be able to keep a little bit of pressure. And I believe it was with this move, rook 8 to d6. And the point is that after king e3, black can play rook b4. And what happens if you want to pause your video, you can even think about this. What happens if white takes on d3 with the rook now? So if white plays rook takes d3, what would be the answer? Okay, so the idea is that if rook takes d3, black has this nice shot, rook takes b3. And white is pinned along the third rank, so they cannot reply with rook takes d6. And rook takes b3 would run into rook takes d1. And black's up a piece and will win. So maybe that was a way I could try to squeeze something out of this position. Uh, it may not lead to a win. In fact, I think white can probably still draw if they play carefully. Uh, but that would be a tactic they'd have to avoid. Instead, though, after king f2, I just went for the immediate rook b4. He took on d3. Now, of course, rook takes b3 does not work. He can just take on d8. So I traded the rooks. And then I played this move, rook b5. This was my plan all along because white cannot defend the a-pawn. Um, but it's pretty easy to figure out what white can do in the meantime while I'm winning this a-pawn. So he played bishop c4. I took the pawn on a5. White gave a check. I came up with my king. And now the point, white plays rook a8. And unfortunately for me, I cannot move this pawn from the a6 square, and white's got two attackers on it. I only have one defender. My knight is too far away from the defense of that a-pawn to even be a factor. So I realized he was just going to take the pawn, and uh, we're going to have uh, an equal number of pawns left on the board and really nothing to, to fight for left. So after rook a8, I played knight d7. This was just to stop any checks on the 7th rank. And he immediately snatched on a6. I traded. And then played g5 and offered a draw, and he immediately accepted. Yeah, it's just knight and three pawns versus uh, bishop and three pawns all on the same side of the board is just a dead draw. There's, it would be pointless for us to play this out. Uh, so the game ended in a draw, and... In some respects, I was happy with this result because I'm black against a very strong player. Um, although I was disappointed not to make the most of my chances because I felt like I had real good opportunities to maybe play for a win after I won the pawn. But it was kind of tricky, and we were both getting into time pressure, uh, him more so than me. Um, but I think some useful takeaways from, from that game, and I was happy to be able to use the Scandi on a, a high level once again. <laughs> so... Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this game analysis, and I'll be back again soon. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.